giving a buy or sell presentation, Mr. Thompson was always the first one to raise his hand. And the question was always, so what? He'd always ask us, so what? You know, he just gave this 10 minute presentation that you stay up all night for, but so what? And I find that question so simple, but important still today. We also learned about expectations, and this might be the most important thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a rumor, and this wasn't my class, but a rumor is that Mr. Thompson shut the door on a slacking class and, and said, if this was the real world, you would all be fired. And, and what a lesson to learn when you're a senior in college and looking to join the professional industry. He taught us simple things too, like how to put a dimple on your tie. Mine's a little sideways now, I should have fixed it before. And, and, and the importance of shining your shoes. He also taught us how to be better people. And there were whole portions of class dedicated to him teaching us about the importance of giving back, of pushing ourselves further, of being authentic. I don't remember anything from my intro to art class and, and certainly nothing from my anthropology class. And I cannot value a stock nowadays, but I remember all of Mr. Thompson's life lessons. And like many alumni, I still receive them today through texts and emails and lunches and dinners in Charlotte. And uh, it, it really is true that once you're in his class, he never stops teaching. And so before I get emotional, I will welcome Mr. Thompson to the floor. Well, as you know, I'm an artist. I think there 
they're showing one of my self-portraits up on the screen there. And the artists were a little rebellious. And we have a favorite quote. And that quote is, you have to know the rules to break the rules. Artists love breaking rules. Well, today, I'm going to break the rules of making a good presentation. I have no introduction. I'm not going to tell you what I'm getting ready to tell you. And you already know why. Because my topic of choice today is loss and fail. So bear with me. We're going to wander around loss for a while. When our two granddaughters come over to the house, Hazel Ann is four and Gracie turns two this Saturday, they start looking for Papa, our Papa. And Papa usually is back in the study, either reading a book or working on a piece of art. And they come back there and look for Papa, and they always want to play hide and seek. So there we go. They always hide first. One, two, three, eight, nine, ten. Here I come, ready or not. Now Gracie, the two-year-old, she's in training. And she thinks if she can stand in a corner and close her eyes, if she can't see you, then you can't see her. She's an easy find. Hazel now, four, and she's small and she's wiry, she really is getting harder to find. And so Papa has to go, hey, squeak. Make some noise so I can find you. So we play this game, go back and forth, back and forth. Of course, when it's my turn to hide, I don't fit under a chair as well or behind a curtain, so I'm a pretty easy find. Talking more about loss of family. My father was a preacher. We always lived in the preacher's house beside the church building. All the way through until I was left to a university, lived the preacher's house. And the preacher's house always had a separate study. And most Saturday afternoons, my father, being a preacher, would kind of camp out in his study. And he would be preparing his sermon and his study notes for the next day. On this particular Saturday, I was being a little too energetic, a little too noisy, a little too demanding of his time, and he got very impatient with me. And my dad was British born, and so he had that dry British wit. And he came out of his study very frustrated, and he looked at me, and he went, Dave, get lost. So I did. I went down Albert Street, across Queen, up King, walked along Young, and we lived in a little town 30 miles east of Toronto, right by Lake Ontario. So when the glaciers came through and cut out those beautiful lakes, they deposited rich, beautiful black soil, a lot of agriculture, a lot of farms, and we had a body of land called the Escarpment. The Escarpment was full of trees and creeks and little lakes and trails. And so I'm a little under 10. I'm probably 8 or 9. And I walk and I walk and I find the Escarpment. I find some trails. All of a sudden, the sun starts to set. And I realize, oh, I'm lost. I didn't have a clue where I was. And I started to get scared and afraid. And so I thought, well, if I head towards Lake Ontario, downhill, eventually I'll find a road. And sure enough, I shifted that way, and I found a little dirt road, which became a little bigger. It ended at a barn, and of course, with a barn, there's a farmer. And I talked to the farmer, and he was quite surprised to see an eight- or nine-year-old walking around way out in the woods farm area by themselves. So I told him my story. And I said, I'm lost. And so I told him my dad was the preacher, and we lived in the preacher's house beside the church building. And so he called my dad. He said, I know your dad. Well, about 45 minutes later, you see the old navy blue Buick coming down the dirt road. Unfortunately, he's driving a little faster than he normally looks. Have you ever seen somebody so mad, their teeth are gnashing? He was furious. And he bounced out of that car and made a beeline for me, and all of a sudden being found wasn't very much fun. And this farmer got in between him. He's a big man. And bless that man. He negotiated that he would attend church tomorrow morning if my dad didn't beat me right there. <laughs> and they agreed. And he showed up at church. We became my friends. With my comments on lost and found today, Heather called me in mid-January. I'm really thinking, you know, what am I going to talk about? I really came to a lot of thoughts. I really couldn't have come down to anything. One of the best characteristics of a great artist, and it's not drawing, it's seeing. If they can see things other people don't see, and they can take that scene 
an expression, an opinion, a piece of artwork. And so I thought, you know, that's a good idea, but I want to do something different. I want to be creative in how I go about writing these comments today of Lost and Found. And so I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to use my eyes. I'm going to use my ears. I'm going to start to listen. I'm going to listen to other people talk. I'm going to listen to all the news channels. I'm going to listen and read the business websites. Um, Sunday mornings, I'm going to listen to the interviews, music and movie awards, political speeches. We've had lots of those. I listen to them as many as I can. I even listen to the NFL Network during the playoffs and the Super Bowl. And I listen to the Weather Channel. I listen to the words and the lyrics of the songs being written today and some of the anger and fear that are in those songs. And I'm asking you today, how many of you have been really listening the last three or four months? And how do you feel about what you're hearing? Are you experiencing some turmoil? Are you experiencing maybe some uncertainty? Because we do live in a world and a culture that is awash with fear and tremendous anxiety. People are lost. There's terrorist attacks, Ebola, gun violence, climate change, immigration issues, economic earthquakes. We have the uncertainty of, a, of an election year, the uncertainty of a Federal Reserve that's not sure whether it should ease or restrict. So I decided to conduct my own independent scientific experiment on listening. This is a very scientific approach. I chose a Friday in February at 4 o'clock. And for five minutes, I went on the internet to one business, one of the more reputable business websites that always has the headlines. And you can punch the button and read that headline for the day. So Friday in February, 4 o'clock, for five minutes, I wrote down some of the headlines on this business news website. Here they are. World economy is in a death spiral. Have you ever been in a death spiral? It's in a death spiral. I'm scared. Oil producers, they keep pumping, even with oil prices going down. The stock market's not working, Kramer said. There's a 445 billion threat in the economy that you're not prepared for. Job growth is slowing. Consumer spending is flat. Are we feeling a little lost right now? Because I know I started feeling a little lost and a little scared. Now there's a parable, and it's called the parable of the talents. And a master decides that he's going to go on a trip. And he brings in three servants, and he gives each one of them property, and says, I want you to produce more while I'm gone on my trip. And he comes back from this, and the parable of the talents tells about servant that had five talents gave back five more. The servant that had two talents gave back two more. And then he came to the one servant that had one talent. And he had buried it in the ground. And he dug it out and he handed the one talent back to the master. The master was very unhappy. He was lost. He was lost. He did not want what to do. He said, Master, I was afraid. I know you're a hard man. I did not act. I buried my talent. I did not produce. Sir, I was lost. And fear overcame him. The second, the lessons come from this. It comes from the first two servants. It comes from that success in any part of life is a product of our works and our actions. We all have times that we're lost. We all have times that we have fear. But the lesson we learn from the talents, the big thing comes out is, he was afraid he buried him, but that's not the real lesson. The real lesson is we all feel afraid. Let's take it and move forward and produce. Viktor Frankl, an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist, as well as a Holocaust survivor, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, partial quote, what really is needed was a fundamental change in our attitude towards life. The man's writing this in a prison camp. It did not really matter what we expected from life, but what life expected from us. Our answer must consist in right action, right conduct. Life ultimately is the responsibility to find the right answer and to take on the right task. 
What he is saying is, you can't stay lost. We must be found. Now, in this painting, it's called Lost and Found. I like to, in the summertime, John Blackburn knows this, I like to paint. And I take my little stand and go to different parts of the Blue Ridge Parkway. This particular painting is at Moses Cone Park, off the Blue Ridge, a little south of Bloin Rock. And I have plein air painted there for two days. And this is called Lost and Found for two reasons. The first reason is this design way I painted it. What I did was, I, it's oil, so you can do this, you can't do this in watercolor. I would paint in the tree, and then I'd paint it out. I'd paint in the fence, and then I would paint it out. I'm painted in and out of that painting five times. So I'd be lost, until I'd be found. Then I'd be lost, and I'd be found. And I, then finally, the last 20 minutes, I painted myself back in. That's the style of the painting. But also, this painting is an expression of my life, of my own journey of lost and found. When, when I was 49, I had the first of three heart attacks. And talk about being lost as a young man and then suffering two mores. And I'm a th proud owner of three stints down the left anterior. And you take these medicines to deal with all that. And my cardiologist at one point said, Dave, 45% of your heart is dead. It's scar tissue will not come back. And so he recommended that I go to a cardio rehab. So for four months, this is a four month program, five days a week, then morning, I go into Wedge Capital, get a couple of hours of work done, light lunch, and at 1 o'clock, I show up at Cardio Rehab. And when you walk in, they put a little monitor on you, and it monitors your heart, they do your blood pressure, they do all the vitals every day for four months, and you walk around a little track, and they have nutritionists there that teach you how to eat. They even bring in counselors, psychologists that specialize in cardiac disease to help you understand the medicines you're taking and the side effects emotionally and physically. And I have to say, I made it through the first four days pretty good. I thought, you know, I can do this. On the fifth day, Friday, midday, they started clearing out the space on the floor. They started to lay down little mats with pillows. You see where we're going? And they started playing soft music. And I thought, oh no. I'm back in kindergarten. <laughs> oh no. And we were instructed, lay on your little mat. And I was devastated. I thought, I'm supposed to be in the corner office at Wedge Capital, strong and powerful, on the plane. I've got a broken heart. And so a nurse sat down with the soft little music and on the pillow, and they read a sweet little story. And I buried my head in my pillow and I cried. I was lost. I was frozen with fear. I did not know what to do. Well, I believe there's a word out there that's stronger and bigger than hide and seek. It's stronger and bigger than lost and found. This one word is stronger and bigger than fear and anxiety, and that one word is hope. Please listen to these words. Hope is the state of your mind, not the state of the world. We all have fears, we all have anxieties, we all have times that we are lost. But the advantage that we have is that inside our heart and our minds, we can hold on to hope, because it's what's inside of me that counts, not what's going on around me. It's really how we react to the world. With our hopes and our dreams and our visions, we become people that make things happen. That make things happen. Recently, though kind of humorous, got a text from our daughter, and it read, the girls are playing hide and seek. At this moment, they're both hiding. <laughs> P.S. Enjoy the piece of work. <laughs> Today is time for us to stand on the mountain and boom and declare it's time for fewer hiders, fewer to be lost. It's time to hold on to our hopes and our dreams Thank you. I, I just want to say, as I was listening, Dave, and thank you so much for sharing your personal journey with us. As I was listening to you tell your story, I couldn't help but remember the comments that David Carroll made 
about what a true leader is and what kind of characteristics he possesses. And I'm going to read those out to you and you tell me, is it not standing before you in the form of David Thompson, nimble, lifelong learning, well-read, ambidextrous, look at this beautiful painting and the technical skills at Wedge Capital, self-awareness, discipline, reinventing yourself over time, communication skills, and the ability to read people, to accept feedback, and to have that self-awareness. Who better to demonstrate those leadership skills than Dave? I do also want to um, thank our Bowden Investment Group students, the CF research, the CFA Research Challenge. You did a tremendous uh, presentation in spite of the glitches with technology. So thank you very much. Very professional, perfect even. Thank you. So we do have a presentation and thank you Delbert for coming up. On behalf of Appalachian State University and the Walker College of Business, we would like to present Mr. Dave Thompson with a token of our appreciation. Please accept here it is. It's very heavy. One moment, please. I'm going to hand it off to the strong one. <laughs> please accept this crystal tower etched with the university seal and date of your presentation to the Boyle's Lecture Series Luncheon as a commemoration of this event. I would like to invite you all to join us for the 2016 Appalachian Pitch Competition at 2 p.m. I recognize Board of Trustees members and those attending, Chancellor, are not able to make it. But those of you who are, we will at the same stage as the Boyles Lecture at 2 p.m. have our Appalachian Pitch Competition. Ten student finalists are pitching their venture ideas. Prizes will be awarded by a panel of industry judges as well as an audience choice award. I'm excited about that. The pitch event is sponsored by Bobby Martin. I believe Bobby's with us. Bobby, you want to stand? Bobby. Bobby is the author of The Hockey Stick Principles and is an Appalachian alumnus, entrepreneur, and author, and will be helping with the festivities next door. Thank you, Bobby. My sincere thanks to all of you for attending and making this a special day. It was my pleasure to have you all here today. Have a great rest of the day.